Okay, so let's uh, begin. Uh, on Tuesday, we talked about the, the network layer and the link layer and the physical layer. So the recap, basically before we move on, is, um, these are things that allow from the network networking application and the transport layer it actually allows your data to flow through from your host to the endpoint, which we'll call the destination, right? Um, in here, uh, what we show you is a real world case study. Uh, everyone in this class used system skill before. It's still not there, it still die. We still need to figure out how to uh, maintain the server, but what if from the Cisco server, right? Basically, you from that you can connect to whatever machine you want to connect, but it's actually inside a network. Okay, so how do I connect to, for example, a server called NetPG or the Python server, the python.cs.musu.io? All right, so what do you actually need? And how do you see the routing table, right? The routing table basically tells you how do I route my, my packets, which includes the request or the data that I want to send to another machine. And one thing you can do is use the, um, not about the instruction, which is not the case, the command called net start with the option dash nr. This would print the kernel IP routing table, basically on that machine, each machine will have the routing table that basically have the mapping, have the mapping of the destination IP with the gateway and the net mask, the, basically the, the subnet mask for each of the IP address you want to access, right? So over here, the NetPG is in the uh, 10.126.125 uh, subnet. Basically, anything under 10.126.125 is within this subnet. And as you can see, this still has two Ethernet connections, ETH 0 and 1. This basically means that I have two roads out of this queue. One road connect to the subnet, which is 10.126.125. Anything there, this you can see. So as you can see, if I want to go to NetPG, right, you will see that the dot one, which is this particular router, is here, right? You can then go there. This means that I have the connection to that location in the IP table. And if I want to you will go to this subnet. If I want to go to this subnet, my IP table will also in this case have this information 10.126.125 because I have the gen mask, right? This mask will just filter out 10.126.125 and the last dot is I don't care. The last dot is for the host IP address, which in this case can be dot 251 which in this case can be dot two two fifty one. And what we know with the, the, the information about how subnet works, right? The Cisco server, which is the to the right of that circle, this guy. See this subnet. So it's C net PG. Now again, if I want to connect to in this case Python server, which is 110.170.31.118, right? What do I have to do? This server is actually like that side right here. It's not inside internally within the subnet of like uh, 10.126.125, right? So I have to go outside. I have to go outside. How do I know how do I go outside of my network? Yeah, there's a router right here, right? And because it's a part of this subnet, right? So one thing I can do, go there through the connection ETH1. This allow me to go outside, all right? To do that, my IP table also has that information here. 
this line 10.27.24 that's another subnet and the mark is 255.255.255.255.0 this means that I'll just filter out the top three bytes as the subnet the rest are for the host. In this case, I then can route to the router, which the router will basically now have the forwarding information. Okay, you want to go to Python server? Here you go. Now, from this point on, from this point on, it's the router job to forward to the right connection. And as you can see, there's also a network right here as well, right? You can also go that direction as well. Now it's just a table how I would do forward things. Okay, uh, internally, because of the way Cisco work is actually it's a container It's like a think of it as a virtual machine, but it's different. It's, like, it's a container in the server. So you can see that actually there's interface to the Docker that is the connection to the physical machine that Cisco is on. Right, so that's why the IP table will have all this information. All right, now. Today, at towards the end of the lecture period, we will just do another example, which is I have a machine, I just connected a Wi Fi and I go to google.com. What actually happened from the beginning to the point I have from opening my Google? All right, so there'll be more full, fully, fully the whole pipeline. Uh, the next thing is what we call ARP, Address Resolution Protocol. Address Resolution Protocol. Right. Um, the question basically that we want to ask is how do I get the interface MAC address? What is the MAC address? Can you can someone give me a recap? Yeah. So each each physical network con, uh, device will have a unique IP, a unique MAC address. This is like every is the same as like every person will have their own unique citizen ID. And there must not be anyone that has or two people with the same ID. That would be weird, right? Same logic apply here, right? Each device will have their own physical MAC address. Now, the ARP table basically will contain information of the IP to the MAC address mapping. So now that we have this table, we are good. I have the IP, I know the MAC address. Now I know the physical unique MAC address of my um, of my connection. The other thing is they also usually tap with the time to live. Time to live allow the mapping to be forgotten eventually. By default, it's like after 20 minutes, I will forgot this mapping. Why do we do this? Because otherwise our table will get really big, right? Uh, the resolution protocol, right? How do we fill the table? So here's what happened. Initially, when you want to do something and you don't have the table information, like the, the table doesn't have your information, what happened is I need to broadcast and say, hey, I want the, the the information about this particular IP address. Can someone tell me? What you do is the MAC address becomes FFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFF
Okay, if I want to go to this IP address, go to that uh, this, this map to this MAC address. The other thing is, as you can see so far, everything is connected using IP. If you want to do something, and if you know the IP address, most likely you can get to the destination. Why is that nice? Again, the same concept back in the low level IO, right? If I have some limited a few entity that can connect and expand from multiple high level API and low level implementation, that's good. That's good. Think of it as, I would put an analogy on this, right? Everyone know the ISA, right? X86 assembly or the ARM ISA. That becomes this hourglass, right? If I write a program and if my compiler can compile into x86, it means I can run at on whatever computer that is capable of running x86. On the hardware side, I can also design whatever crazy ship I want as long as I support x86, I'm good. Again, the hourglass concept, the IP address in the network has the same concept. If I can get to work with my IP address, I'm good. So upper level, you have TCP and UDP, two protocols that work with IP address. Then on top of TCP and UDP, you have the application level protocol, HTTP, SMTP, RTP. Those also work with TCP, which means you work with IP, right? Now, on the lower level, if I want to build a company, let's say I am also another crazy person, want to build a company that create crazy network adapter. If I have my device work with IP, I'm good. Then I can optimize the hardware, whatever I want. All right. So now I can change the Ethernet connection, I change how Wi Fi works, becomes 3G, 4G, 5G. They work with IP, I'm good. All right, then down to the mathematical and physical and physics and math. I can use copper, I can use fiber, optic, I can use radio, or I can use crazy things which I don't even <laughs> cannot imagine to be honest. But yeah, I can then use whatever device to physically transport my data. All right, as long as they work with IP address, I'm good. Yes. Huh? Yes. What do you, what actually happened when you connect to, you should, anyone try like go to airplane mode and go back in again, right? Then you talk, what happened is there'll be some, uh, your, your modem, your modem will actually talk to the cellular, the, the, the cell tower that are closest to you. Say, hey, I am a new device, let me get connected. Once you need to do anything on a top level, like HTTP request or whatever, they would do like TCP or UDP, like under the knee, under, under that boot, right? In, in and like iOS or Android, whatever you're using right now, right? They will be implemented either using TCP or UDP to communicate. Huh? How about just see your data? That's like the physical level, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the cell tower is at like basically this level. The physical level, how do I implement the cell tower? How do I actually uh, broadcast the signal to all the devices that want to connect to my tower? Then from the like electrical signal that you got, you then would use some of these protocols so the tower will have to handle that. Translate to whatever protocol. Now it would allow the ISP that connect to it, like ETAP, yeah, yeah, or true. Oh, I guess they, it's only two left, right? Yeah, sad thing. Anyway, <laughs> then it allowed your phone to now be discoverable by the destination. And now you can also send anything to the, to the internet. 
So that's why the IP we call it Internet Protocol because basically that's a protocol that operates the internet. Now, from the physical device, right? It's basically your your phone modem to the cell tower. Now, on the upper level, your phone, Android like implementation of TCP would work with whatever protocol on the other end, the, the destination, the port, right? Then on the modem itself, that will have to work with say the the route like all those switches router at the ISP. Now that it got your data package, their job is to make sure it gets forwarded correctly. Yeah. Anyone notice like when when for example if we use DPAS and if things went down, the other company is like fine, right? And it can be any company. Okay, I click, I click run one at random. Okay, all right. I know I use this tag it go down pretty often. Can I say that? I'm recording. Sorry. Um. Anyway, so basically, let's say you use one ISP and it went down, right? It's basically because that particular ISP it might have some problem at that moment with the network, right? Then it's the matter of how you would implement on a network level, like right? how to manage each of the situation. Right, the routing policy, congestion control. How do you actually forward the packet? Let's say anyone be into a graduation ceremony and you realize your phone stopped working. Yeah, too many phones connect to one tower. That's what happens. Right, they get flooded, and that's like a theory. When you start keep sending data over, right, the time it takes to process your packet go exponentially up because you have the the queuing the queuing time. That keep going up because more people want to connect. Now more people want to connect. Everyone wait longer because everyone wait longer. More packet coming in, so you keep wait even longer. Yeah. Huh? You you get nothing. Nothing will be sent over the internet. But like everyone is flooding. Yeah. <laughs> the, the power. Yeah, it's just like every concert, every big event is always like that, right? Um, I mean, to be honest, if you throw more money at the problem, you will be, it will be less severe, right? Um, I mean, imagine if you're in like Manchester and you go to like a football match, right? I don't think the company would survive if like for every football match, you cannot use the phone, right? So, I mean, that's definitely a way to <laughs> theoretically to solve it. There was a lot of research to go into how to solve it cheaply so that the cost is a big thing, right? You know, it's open end, right? Oh, some of them are, are solved, some of them are new problems. So, yeah, these are fun. Again, whatever my definition of fun is, might not align with yours. All right, so we, we talked about this La, on Tuesday. The principle of the internet basically, the goal is I want to connect something. And I would assume the two sides are the smart thing. That's that's where computation happens, right? The IP protocol allows this narrow way of really simple connectivity. I don't want to connect things, so I want to have a really, really simple protocol. The protocol is I have this header that contains information about my data packet, how big are they, uh, making sure they are correct and things like that. Some of them doesn't even make sure the data is correct, right? They send it over, someone eventually should get the packet. Then you can design an engineer on top of it, how to make it uh, reliable and things like that. It's like basically things are built on top of this principle. Now, the, we talked about this again also on Tuesday, the end-to-end -end argument is a uh, network. Back in the day is, well, I wouldn't call it stupid, but it just connect things. It's actually really, really smart on how they're connecting and how they're routing, but that's their job. They don't do computation. Your data is being computed at the two end. All right. Um, again, it's been kind of like this until like 2005, where people start to like, hey, what if we do? Well, these network devices are complex. What if we program on them and see if we can offload something on, onto the switch? onto the router and well these crazy fancy network adapter um 
Sometimes we would call it programmable NIC, programmable network interface card, because they are literally programmable. You can program something on them. There are people who do like key value store on the network, because why not? You're maintaining a huge database. Why do you spend the CPU to do something that the network can do? Right. So that a proposal like this, so it's, it's changing right now. So all I know, what you can expect is hopefully things will get faster and faster, which is nice. All right. And also hopefully more job opening for everyone here in the room, because the more fancy things you can engineer, the more job for you guys. You have to be those engineers, those scientists. All right. Just don't forget that you are the one building it. We, we, we are. Right, so yeah, as a team. All right, so that wrap up lecture 12, which is what we're supposed to go over on Tuesday. So let's do Thursday. And I would assume the same thing. No one watched through the lecture. Yay. A little bit. Okay. <laughs> All right, so today I will talk about TCP and UDP, which should cover almost everything else. All right. TCP is a, these are transport service protocols. These are the way you would transport the two ends, the protocol that dictates how do you send the data, how do you organize the data into the packet and ensure that the, the other side got your data. All right. These are the logical communication, the logical communication, just like a, on, a, on a logical level, not the physical level, physical level is like your switch, your router, right? Uh, you can check out the document called RFP 768, which contain the specification of the UDP protocol, which we can expand now. Okay. What is UDP? Basically, this is like the most bare bones. I want to send the data over and I don't want to guarantee anything. If the packet is lost, good luck, it's lost. If you got Packets one, two, three, and four, and you uh, the the arrival is four, three, one, and two. Your job, I don't care. What I want to do is just send things over. This is the most well. This is the bare bone no frill transport protocol. What's the benefit? We talked about the benefit a little bit earlier. So what's the benefit of UDP? Look at this bullet point. Yes. Compared to TCP, are they, which are which are faster, which are likely to be more like like basically having more performance. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, I don't care about anything. I don't have to have anything else to double check to whatever to check that is my packet lost. I don't care. It's gone. All right, deal with it. Okay. Um. There's also Connection less. There's no handshake between the sender and the receiver. All right. Um, why is that a UDP in the beginning? Well, in the beginning, that we didn't. Uh, we don't need connection establishment. Connection establishment when you is when you like ping the server quickly, like saying, "Hey, I'm here. Can I connect to you?" Nope. Nothing like that. I just send things over, assuming that something on the other side to get my packets. All right. It's simple. Uh, I just need, well, to be honest, I just need the sender and I just need some kind of receiver that hopefully connect to me. Right. Small header size, no congestion control. Can be blast away really, really quickly. The use is. For one one thing that is really, really useful is how many people stream things these days? Did you notice if like one pixel go wrong on one frame? On one frame, which is like one sixty of the second and only one pixel go wrong. Not really, right? Not really. And sometimes you see how like, for example, YouTube, when you watch YouTube, sometimes it automatically changes your resolution based on how fast is your internet. What if I, I have a policy that maybe send make sure I can render the 240p, then the like the 70 720p is like the 
the the back end like if i can send all the data over i would like to learn when it's 720p udp is perfect for this thing right if i packet loss if my data is lost that's okay many people will not realize it right uh so used by dns SND, uh, snmp and http3 now if you look at http3 for example right you cannot tolerate error because for example if you have like if you request for like index.html and one of the text goes wrong what will happen to that page when kaboom right you can't render the html page right you can't have syntax error on your html code because otherwise then you do look weird uh what the new protocol the http version 3 do is well, let's use UDP, but I am going to implement the reliability checking at my application layer. Why is this good? In modern day computing, so let's look at the trade off, right? Let's now look at the trade off. Back in the day, let's look at the year 2000. How good is your internet? <laughs> yes, modem, right? 56K modem, really slow unreliable it gets dropped all the time so you better use tcp because you want to rely on a really pretty reliable transport protocol because if things go wrong because a lot of things will go wrong hopefully you can still render whatever page you are trying to look at it might take one minute it might take two minutes i mean yeah i've lived through the day when if i want to go to like yahoo.com <laughs> before google right um take a long time to render now with modern day computer and the network we actually now it's now capable of pumping in a lot of data right so why don't we take advantage of udp we have a, a crazy cpu anyway so if you have to do extra work at the two sides to ensure reliability i can do it network is capable enough i mean if i drop like five packages Send them over again. Who cares, right? It's well, people care, but it, it's much cheaper to do it. So HTTP version three, it actually now makes sense if you think about it. It's a trade-off with your with our world network infrastructure, right? Now you can do everything in the application layer. Another benefit of doing this in the application layer is, I mean, if you really, really want to modify that right as a user application yeah you can do it right it means that it can be catered towards whatever application you're developing you don't have to rely on the network layer right give more power to the application developer and make sure the default version works right if they don't want to program if they don't want to touch this it should work from the get-go now here's the action so let's say i'm I'm sending uh, uh, UDP between two SNMP, uh, the client and the server. Um, the sender, the sender basically want to send some message, as you can see on here, on the slide. Right? What I need to do is plug in the header to the message. Plug in the header to the message. Now, I create this UDP header segment. And when I want to actually send it, I attach the segment to the IP, the network protocol, the internet protocol. The IP, don't, don't forget, the IP is in this layer. It's like below the UDP. Once you're done with UDP, then you packet your, your UDP message into the network message using IP information as a header. So you have IP then UDP, then your message. Like every message is wrapped by that network level information. Then you keep wrapping, wrapping, wrapping so that when you send things over, whoever see the message just extract the current header out of the, the rest of it, send it up, all right? Now, when you send the 
send the message to the receiver, right? You got the IP, the IP, the network, the network layer extracts the IP header out. You basically now have the header, the UDP header here, right? As I, as the one I just draw, then it looks at the header. Inside the header, there's this thing called checksum. Anyone remember checksum? What does checksum do? Yeah, it check if the, the, the thing you're sending is corrupted or not. It can be, oh, okay. Check sum is basically I sum every, can be every byte in the data I have right now. I add them up. And the way check sum works is I will store the sum with my message. Now, whoever got my message, let's say I have data corruption, I do the same thing. I sum everything up. Now, my total. Before and after I said, if I have data corruption, what happened to my sum? Different. It's going to be different sum, right? So that's what check sum is for. In this case, I said check sum with UDP. If the sum is wrong, okay, some corruption happened. So check the check sum. More than half, it should be correct, right? Your network is stable, so you're, you're not going to have like random like drop or like uh, not drop, but like bit slips, right? Um, then you demultiplex the message extract the header out, send the actual message up to the application layer. Here's your message, do whatever you want with it. That's it. All right, yes. Here, yeah. But if the checksum bits are messed up? If the checksum bits are messed up, your data, because both sides perform a checksum, if the checksum bits are messed up, you also know that something is messed up. Because the key here is as long as I think something is messed up, maybe I just send it again. The key is whether I can detect. So here, here, here's one thing I want to kind of separate out, right? That's the detection part. Oh. Detection and the correction part. So the checksum per perform the detection task. Is something wrong? If the checksum is correct, my assumption would be 99.9999% of the time. If I'm super unlucky, that's the only case that the checksum can still be correct. But most of the time, it's going to be able to detect something is wrong with my message, right? Now, correction can, well, you can use multiple things, right? Because you rely on UDP, you only have detection happen at the application level depending on how you would handle that maybe you said hey send the same request again because something is wrong right retry for example right um so that's the idea of the checksum i add like for example i i look at five numbers i add them up store the sum if something go wrong the sum should be incorrect now i can detect the error as you can see here, UDP segment header, 32 bits. How big is that? Four bytes. Four bytes. Source, destination, and also just the source port, destination port. Because that's all I need, right? I just need the port number to actually make a connection because the lower layer, once I know the port number, I mean, socket is already established so I can send that message through the port. And I would assume that everything is connected properly. So I just send that through, through the port. The length of my message and the checksum. That's it. That's it. That's all. The rest are your data. Somehow we call this the payload. It's the same name you would use in like logistics. The payload is what you want to carry with you. That's the data. All right. Now, Quick summary, again, this is like no frill protocol. I just send things over. Uh, it does have the plus, which is you don't have to set, you don't have to set up. You say, hey, I have, I have this method, send it to this port. Hopefully you have to set up at the port that connect the two sides. If not, well, I try to send it anyway. Um, can function when the network service is compromised. Because you just send the kind of basically raw data with the checksum, right? Um, it does have the checksum to help 
with reliability so you can detect some error. So you can then do what HTTP version 3 did, which is I would use UDP and then I have functionality I add on top on the application layer to make sure that I can get whatever TCP is giving me, which is in order arrival, all those things, right? Now we mentioned TCP, so here's the overview. Uh, point to point, one sender, one receiver. And the word point to point suggests that I have a connection, it's one sender, one receiver. Connection oriented, I have to do the handshake. I need to make sure I talk to the receiver. Hey, I'm connected. Can I send things over? You have to do that in TCP. Flow control. Flow control means that uh, how many people seen like a, a highway where that's like a gate at the beginning before you can go into the highway. Like, I, huh? it's not a toll. Like, I'll give you this example. I was in Seattle for like my internship, right? Uh, and then the highway in Seattle would have this. Before you go into the highway, there's a red light that acts like a stop sign. It just alternates red, green, red, green, red, green, red, green, quickly in this pattern. But every car had to stop before I like, have to do a complete stop before you can go wait for the green light. Sometimes if the highway is super congested, the red light stay longer. So you have to wait longer until you can go into the highway. That's flow control. Control the flow coming in. TCP has flow control. Why? Because if you put everything to the receiver from outside, the server might die, right? So that, that, that's why TCP has the built-in flow control. Uh, to duplex data, it means that when you have the connection, data flow in and out both ways. That's it. That's what full duplex means, just both ways. Um, there's also no message boundary and it's reliable. If you send something, you guarantee the receiver will get the message. Doesn't guarantee when, but they will get the message. And you get the byte stream in order. You send one, two, three, four, the receiver, the receiver will get one, two, three, four. In UDP, they might get one, four, three, and two get dropped. Right. So now that's the trade off. Uh, principle of reliable data transfer is basically uh, first, if you abstract, like on the left side here, right? On the left, oh, sorry. On the left side here is the abstraction of my reliable data transfer is basically i have something that wants to send the process everything looks the same i want to send some data over in the middle here right this is this part here is a reliable connection that i can connect the two sides together now the implementation is different why your connection is in the physical layer right so what actually happened is the sender side will use a protocol that guarantee reliability, guarantee in order. So you send the data over to a TCP layer. Then TCP use the network layer. Now the network layer has no guarantee whatsoever. It's just like, oh, packet, I want to send it. That's all. Packet can get dropped, internet can drop. Your computer can drop from the router, the network is like, oh, that's the best I can do, right? TCP guarantee that if things get dropped, there's some, some way to make sure it, if I send it, it should get my connection. If your network get dropped, the connection drop. So your application will know, hey, connection drop, I cannot send anymore. TCP guarantee that I need connection. So you first need to reestablish the connection before you can send the next data packet. So now everything is done in this layer to make sure those are done properly, right? Now, if you look at this diagram, my question is, does HTTP3 kind of make sense then? I just push whatever 
circle here, the sender side reliable data transfer protocol and the receiver side data transfer protocol, I just push it from the transport layer. I use UDP, I don't care. Then I push it up. Now everything is done in the application layer. All right, so that's the HTTP 3.0. All right. Now, here's the TCP. Basic idea, I have a first packet I want to transmit at T0. The basic idea is a stop and wait protocol. I send the data over, the first bit arrives at whatever time here. Uh, here, right? Then both sides keep sending data over. The sender is done at this time. The sender is done at this time. I mean, the sender is done. I don't have to do anything anymore, right? It's like I go to the post office, I'm done. Then the post office will take a packet and then go to the sender, uh, receiver. Now the receiver will process these data coming in, keep getting the data and say, hey, okay, that's it. Act, act means acknowledgement. I'm done. Send a quick message back to the sender. Hey, it's like when you have the EMS message and uh, which never happens, but yeah, like you can set like, for example, maybe automate system that would send an email to me saying, hey, the package arrived, right? The round trip back is that email from the, the receiver saying, hey, my package arrived. Both the way down there and the way back takes some time. It takes some time, right? Acknowledgement arrives, then you can send the next packet the next packet. Now, the overhead, we call this the, well, the overhead to send things over and back, we call this the round trip time. So the whole thing, one packet, will take round trip time because you have to go back and forth, plus the time you actually need to send the data. So basically it's RTT, the round trip time, plus this part. This is the L over R. Y L O R. That's the payload. The total things you want to send divided by the packet size. Uh, not not the packet size. How many packets you want to send? That's one packet. Because you have to send a bunch of things. You have to send a bunch of things. All right. So that's a stop and wait protocol. I send something. I stop here. Sender do nothing. It's like I stop at the post office and wait until I got the email saying okay, it is arrived. Now, how do I deal with error and packet loss? Easy thing. The idea, if I want to send some mail from the post office, and I want to detect if everyone got my packet in the same order or not, what do I do? Let's say I have 10 mails I want to send. I would number them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Send them all over. The receiving end will see, okay, one, two, three, four, five, ten, eight, nine, whatever order that arrived, but you have the, the number. It means that you can store it back, saying, hey, okay, I get one, two, ten. If something is missing, you also know it's missing, so you can resend, right? So that's the key idea. Now, because we don't have any guarantee on how long it would have arrived, usually we have this thing called a timeout. Anyone heard of this word timeout before? Timeout is like a ticking time bomb that will blow up if time passed certain threshold. In this case, if you wait and you never get the act from the receiver, it means that, hey, I'm waiting long enough. What do you have to do? Send it again. Yeah, send it again. So that's timeout. Uh, in theory, timeout should be definitely greater than round trip time because if it's less than round trip time, there's definitely no way. There's no way you can tell. You have to wait at least that much plus some more. All right. 
uh, here's the in action. The left side is when snow loss. You have packet zero, packet one that you want to send. You send packet zero, act zero, packet one, act one, packet zero, act zero. So you can keep doing this again, again, and again. Now, let's say you have packet loss. You send packet zero, you got act, yeah, packet zero arrived. Packet one is sent, and you wait five days. What do you do? Call the other side, like, did you get my message? Did you get my packet? Then you resend. That's it. That's how you can handle it in action. So my next question, what if, I mean, the packet loss can happen on your packet on the way to the receiver and can happen on the act back to you. Here, the left column is the receiver actually got your data, but the act never got back to the sender. In this case, the sender do the same thing. Time out, I send it again. The receiver will get the same packet twice, right? What you have to do in this case, delete the second packet. Because it's the same thing, it's a duplicate. Why do you waste memory of compute power to process it? Delete that. All right? Now, yes. How, basically, what, how do we, what should be the policy to check the signal, right? Uh, usually it is a configurable and you just pick a number. It can be like one minute. Say, hey, uh, if my network connection behaves this way, I expect that. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Oh, the, uh, the sender has the timeout. The receiver does not have to do any timeout. The receiver, the only thing receiver has to do, if you got the message, send the act. If you got a duplicate, delete the duplicate again. All right. Why? Because the only case that I will send, I will receive a duplicate is something timeout. So that's okay. The sender is the one that has to manage timeout. These are configured by the OS, right? But the idea is if timeout happens, it doesn't hurt to send the package again. And that's it. It's simple and it works. So the second case is when maybe the network gets super slow. So you actually come out. Okay. So when you actually come out this way, you actually will resend the packet. Eventually, if you receive the app, doesn't matter. I already resend. So you guarantee the receiver will have that packet. So it's okay as well. Now, this was like HTTP 1.0, right? So the newer version of HTTP have a pipeline. The pipeline in this case is when I send things over, I don't send just one packet, I send multiple packets. So you will work that you have to do. When you start to send the first packet, you send the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, whatever. Now, with each packet, we'll have the ID as well. So the app that comes back from the server, we'll have the ID tag to them. So in that way, you will know, okay, the receiver gets packet one, two, four, and five. Now I just need to reason packet number three because I come out, all right? Um, now, this is the handshake part. Basically, before you can start sending packets over. So if you, if you look at this, right? You send things over, assuming that that's already connection. Before you do anything here, before you do anything here, the first thing you have to do is you have to do the handshake, which is, hey, server, I want to connect to you. Can you connect to me? That's the handshake. That's the first thing you have to do. Oops, sorry. That is this part. This is the handshake. This is the sending the data. Now, what happened at the handshake time? For example, you would start the sequence number. You tell the server, my packet would number from 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. You can send that during the handshake. So that both sides know what they're expecting. 
both sides know how many packets might be there. Well, not how many packets, but what the beginning number. You need the sequence number. Then each side afterward, when you're done, you close the connection. After you're done, then you can close the connection. So that's the summary of the TCP. TCP in order delivery, you send one after another after another connection oriented, right? So you have to do the handshake. You have to have the sequence number. With the sequence number, you get in order delivery. It will also prevent congestion. If the network cannot keep up, you will slow down the sender. Why? Imagine that highway example in Seattle, right? I have the highway that control how many cars can go into the highway. Same thing. I have the, the receiver say, hey, the network is like too congested. Sender will stop will slowing down. We throttle. Some of you also use the word throttling. Throttle means I, I can slow down. Um, the flow is also is regulated, so the client cannot overwhelm the server. So we did not cover how congestion control works. We did not talk about how flow control works. These are kind of like the, the, the second networking class. So basically, if you if we were to have the network class that follow this, these are some real talk policy. All right, we'll talk about policy. So if you're curious, let me know. I, to be honest, uh, I'm a lot more familiar with what happened inside the CPU. So we do have the same thing, flow control, congestion control. I did work on that, but not the network layer. And the way it's done is a little bit different on how, how you can connect things. Um, TCP is a massive success because if you want to connect, it's reliable, it works, and it allows you to browse whatever you want to browse. Okay. UDP is pretty much UDP. When you think of UDP, simple source destination port number, number of packets, I mean, the number of bytes I'm sending, checksum. That's it. Simple, fast, not so reliable. So you need to implement the application layer that handles them. All right. Now, the second thing is that we have to, to talk about today is caching. So shall we take a quick break, five minutes? OK, let's do that. So as you can see through many lectures so far, right, caching, the, the concept of caching is used everywhere. The ARP table that they say, hey, if I want to get the MAC address of some machine that I don't know, I'll do the broadcast and I'll store the mapping in the table. That's caching. My own machine will have the information. I don't have to always broadcast. DNS server, you have the local DNS server, so you don't have to connect to those 13 global root level DNS server all the time. That's caching. The switching table, the bridging table in the network layer, also that's caching. The forwarding table in the IP layer, also that's caching, right? Uh, the if modified in HTTP 1.1 is also caching. Basically, this allows your computer to detect that, hey, some, something on a server is modified. So you better get the new page if you're using Chrome again, not using the cache version on your machine. Now, here's my question. Good for thought, I guess, because we're not going to dive too deep into that. But good for thought is, if you cache it, it means that you have to have the mechanism to detect if this thing is out of date. Right? Uh, there are multiple ways you can do this. You can have the mechanism that say, if someone modified that data, let me know. So if, if the server modifies something, then that to the client. That's straight out to that. That's also a downside of that approach. For example, it's not so efficient because I mean, sometimes I don't need to use it right now. I can also try to do the HTTP 1.1 approach. If I want to access something, if it's modified, get the new version. Right. 
So you can also do uh, the timeout and do best effort. In ARP table, if I have the old mapping, I try to go to that MAC address, it doesn't exist, get it again, right? Um, local DNS server, just rely on the local server to make sure that it's updated with the global server, right? So now that we kind of wrap the whole stack up, here's a day in life in your, uh, basically how you use the internet. Uh, let's pick the instance when you just join the network for the first time to include the DNS and everything into the mix, right? So here you join the network. You request the page www.google.com, right? Normal everyday life. You wake up and this is basically main main thing we do. This sounds simple. So what do we do first? What's the first step? Okay. Before we go there, what information do I have right now? Someone want to go to Google. That's it. That's my information. Who is that someone? I have my own. IP address for my machine, I have my MAC address for my machine. Additional assumption, I know DNS service here in the AIS network. Okay. And you are connected to the school network. Okay. Now you request google.com. What do you do? What happened first? Oh, DNS server. But before, even in that chest, you just join the network, right? You just join the network. The connecting laptop needs the ID. So what happened is even before you go to the server, right? Uh, to know the IP, you go to DHCP to get the IP address for the laptop. So you first go to the DHCP. Uh, DHCP would use UDP as a transport protocol, not TCP, just UDP. All right. Uh, they will that the message is your IP address, right? Again, message is your IP address. Let me draw it up. That's your message. I want to send this over back to my my machine from the DHCP server. Okay, because I need to send things over through UDP. The IP address will be attached with the UDP header. All right, then, then you would need the Ethernet frame, right, to know where you want to send this over in the Ethernet. Now, question, do I know where DHCP is? You have the IP, right? You have the IP address. Do you have the MAC address? The first time you connect, you have nothing. You have the IP or the DHCP, right? You, the router has that. Now, what you would do is you would broadcast to the router, say, hey, I, I want to connect to the, the IP address to get my own IP address. I want to connect to a DHCP server to so that it generate my IP address, right? The DHCP request, which asks for my IP address, is wrapped in UDP, then wrapped to Ethernet. You connect, right? Now, after this step, right? After the step, DHCP say, hey, all right, I got your message. I got your message. Here's your IP. So the DHCP server here is replying. Again, the same step, the IP address with the UDP header, with the Ethernet header in a packet, send it over to the client, all right? Now with the Ethernet packet, the switch know where to go, go back to your client, your machine. Now, 
when it arrives at your machine, you see the UDP header with the ID. You extract the UDP header, double check with the checksum, is this correct? Then read the IP. Now your machine has the IP address. All right? Has the IP address. Any questions so far? Now I have my IP address. All right, so what's the next step? You said it already. Um, before DNS, before HTTP, I need the ARP. Why is that the case? I want to go to the DNS server. All right, I first want, want to go to the DNS server. I create, I create this DNS query, say, hey, I want to figure out who is google.com, okay? I wrap that up in UDP because DNS also works with UDP. I have the UDP header, then I put the ETH uh, header on top of it so that it can be sent through the internet, to the internet, right? Then my router, the, the, the problem is I don't have the MAC address of my router. Because earlier on, when I talked to the DHCP, I used the broadcast. I broadcast, I talked to everyone. Now, the, the, the problem I have is, okay, I need to talk to the router. It means I need the ARP. So you first broadcast to everyone, hey, who, who, who is this IP address? Which is the router, you know the router IP address, right? Who is the router IP address? The router got it like, okay, my name is, so that's your MAC address. The IP, the MAC address of the router is now sent back to your machine. You build that ARP table saying, hey, this IP address, which corresponds to the router, is this MAC address. Then your network interface card can then actually now go to the, it can send this DNS package to the router. So the router now will announce, okay, now it's a DNS query to this DNS server, so let me send it over, right? To use DNS, DNS server get your request, right? The IP datagram, the IP datagram, which is whatever IP you want to connect, is will be available on the DNS server based on your, well, your query, which is www.google.com. Afterward, afterward, DNS replies to the client the IP address of Google. With me so far, now we know where is the router, we know where is the DNS server, DNS server just reply, here is the IP of Google. Okay, almost there. All right, now the whole thing, this step happened through your Mahidon network, router will then forward to AIS network then forward to AIS DNS server to get your servant all the way back when you reply, okay? Now you can use TCP to, to establish the connection by do the HTTP request. TCP hook the computer to the Google web server because now you have the IP address, you can make the connection, Google server take the TCP connection coming in, they okay, accept. Then you start sending the packet over to www.google.com. Now, afterward, after your handshake in the TCP is done, after the handshake is done, then the, the, the web server can finally receive your request, which is the get request. I want to get the main page of Google, the server, reply with here is the slash at the beginning, like google.com text box, what you can search. That's it, right? As you can see, there's multiple steps involved here. And that's the gist of what we've been talking about for the past like five lectures, right? As a socket programming, we have socket programming, then we have TCP, we have UDP, you have the IP, uh, the internet protocol layer, uh, then you have the internet layer, and then you have the physical layer. All right, any questions so far before we move on to a uh, long giant Q&A on your project?
Uh, there's a quick uh, question on the chat uh, that asked uh, earlier with the time out, right? Uh, the question is, let me read the question. So in the diagram, right? There was a diagram here that why do the sender have to send packet zero again in this case? Uh, it, it just it's just a series of things. I want to send packet zero and packet one and packet zero again. Just like this is what I want to do. This is like originally what I was doing. Packet zero, then packet one, then packet zero. It's just what I want to do. Now the timeout will make the sequence different depending on the situation. Yeah, that's all. All right, so that's wrap uh, today's lecture. Uh, I will make sure to upload these videos uh, hopefully by tonight, if not tomorrow. Uh, if I do forget, please email uh, let me know i will definitely do that it's like I, it's not like i mind the second thing is for my annotated uh 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 slide decks that i just write uh i also don't mind sharing that remind me please it, it's just a matter of like i need some reminder and uh, I'm, I'm a bad person that day. <laughs> sorry about that um but yeah that's wrap today's lecture uh if anyone have any questions on the project let me know right now all right